welcome to the Easy Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast. My name is Anna Sabrowski, and in today's episode, we will actually not be talking about the liver. But we will be talking, we'll talking about a topic that I think is nevertheless extremely important. So let me try to set the stage. Imagine yourself maybe a couple of years ago when you were trying to make your career choices. Maybe you said, I want to be a doctor because I want to help people, or you said, I want to be a scientist because I want to generate new knowledge. And then you finished your studies, you entered the workforce, and you were faced with bureaucracy, with a lot of administrative tasks, paperwork, maybe even more paperwork. When you're a doctor, you're working in long hours, and maybe you feel that you nevertheless do not really have any sufficient face-to-face -face time with your patients. You have insufficient time for your family, your friends, your kids. You feel you're starting to grow a kind of feeling of work-related insufficiency. You're not doing enough. You're not being enough. You're not accomplishing enough. And maybe you're also afraid to make wrong career choices. You're saying yes to each and every talk. You're accepting each and every unpaid extra position. And this may be leading to overcommitment. And for some of us, this may actually result in burnout. So um, this will be our topic today. And I'm extremely glad that I'm joined by a real fantastic panel and um, Maria, Kelly and Dina, I would like to ask you to introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Dina Tiniakos. I'm a pathologist and I work in Athens, Greece and Newcastle, UK. And I work in the field of digestive diseases and have published on burnout, especially among uh, doctors who work in digestive medicine. Hi, my name is Kelly Korak, and I am a solar physicist. Um, I study the sun. And why I'm here on this burnout panel is actually because I uh, wrote a on my own uh, journey through burnout and through coming out the other side. So I'm here to share some of that today. Um, I work um, in Washington, D.C. as a solar physicist and uh, working on a solar eclipse right now. Hi, I'm uh, Maria Panagiotti. I'm a psychologist by background, and um, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester in health, in the health services department, where I focus more about uh, understanding how to improve health services. And one of the key areas that I focus on is how to improve the well-being of um, health professionals. Right, and I'm glad to have you all here today. And um, like Kelly. I actually have to admit I googled you. So um, and I have to say you are on Google this or inspiring person, as you said, an astrophysicist from, from Harvard. Um, you talk about launching rockets and you study the sun and the universe. And when I read all those, I felt like, you know, I kind of really want to be a little bit more like you. But also you published, as you mentioned in Nature earlier this year, your own story um about your burnout, so you basically made your own story public. So um, I would like to ask you whether you can share with us your story and whether you could describe the first symptoms yes. when you were realizing that things were not just really going the right direction. Definitely, and thank you so much for highlighting this really important topic. So what I started feeling was really, I think, exacerbated by the pandemic. When we went into isolation, those little pieces of my job that brought me joy were no longer available to me. So what I started to feel is very cynical. Um, I was very angry at my job. Um, I had lost, I had also recently launched um, a major project and so felt a little lost. I uh, didn't have a purpose um, as to the next best thing, um, but also trying to take advantage of all of the amazing things that were in front of me. So like you said earlier, um, saying yes to everything, but then being angry that I didn't have any time for a life or didn't have any time for dance or for other things that really brought me joy. Um, so it really came down um, to a head uh, during the pandemic. It probably was going on for actually two to three years. Um, and then um, and then during the pandemic, when again, those other things that kind of brought me a little joy just disappeared, um, I really went into just a really um, agitated state that was very irritable. And I consulted with doctors as to what was going on. Um, and multiple of them told me, you're burnt out, you need to take some time. Um, and it really took me, it actually took me a month or two to decide that I needed time off um, and took some time off and was really getting back to nature and the basics because I was so 
burnt out at the time, that my nervous system was just overloaded. It couldn't really process things well. Um, so it was time for me to take a rest. And so I was able to take a two month rest um, and spend time in nature, running, getting back to things that I really loved with my family and with friends. Um, and so was able to um, was able to to come back from that and also get very clear on what the next steps were. Dina and Maria, you've been doing a lot of research um, on burnout. So when you hear Kelly's story, um, the symptoms that that she felt that she realized um, can you allude maybe to, to your research and what you are seeing and, and um, what you found out? Uh, of course. I mean, uh, um, it is very closely related to what, um, uh, to what uh, the key symptoms of um, key signs of burnout, let's say, are such as exhaustion, both um, emotional and physical exhaustion. It's also um, uh, there is also it's also related with a sense of detachment and um, um, unable to um, to connect and enjoy the the things in life that um, uh, bring people uh, bring joy to people's lives and um, there is also a sense of um, reduced let's say personal achievement and accomplishment. Um, even though uh, some health professionals and some academics might be really successful and might have great impact uh, from the, uh, arising from their work, uh, because of burnout, they might not be able to see the positives and the and the positive impact that their work is having on others as well as as well as um, uh, to their own career. So um, it's really kind of distorted, let's say, sense of. Um, the impact of the, that their work is having um, in the community, and we definitely need to address it. Yes, and also I would and, like to add that at this point uh, that uh, it's exactly how the term burnout came came about by the German-born uh, American psychologist uh, Herbert Freudenberger. Uh, he was looking at his patients who were uh, drug addicts, and they were completely detached and they were just staring to the cigarette they had in their hands that it was burning out until it burned out. So this is the, the state that people feel exhausted, depersonalized and feeling detached. That was the main uh, trigger to, to use this term since the 80s. And I also would like to add, to add that this is the key, let's say, um, signs that we measure when we actually assess burnout. There is a, there are a number of measures. The most well known one is the Maslach burnout inventory, and this is um, these are the types of uh, signs that we are looking at. It, it is important to monitor it quite regularly as well. And um, so, so can you said you you consulted with some some physicians or psychologists, I I assume, and they basically. Came up quick with the diagnosis. Um, did your did your personal and or your work environment also come up with a diagnosis, or did it go unre unrealized to them? I think that there was some indication to folks that um, I was slowing down, or I wasn't quite as efficient. I wasn't very patient with people. Um, I was known to be um, a pretty good listener, and at that point in time, there was no one, I couldn't talk to anyone, right? It was not a very, um, I, I was very burnt out. So uh, mm -hmm. I was not able to engage. So I think folks had some clue, um, but at the same time, I don't think that they, I don't think it's normally looked at. I think there's a lot of, um, for me, mid-career um, was not a time where you get a lot of guidance. Um, you're expected to do what you're doing, right? You're supposed to go to conferences and you're supposed to give talks and you're supposed to mentor grad students. and you're just supposed to do all those things. And of course you're tired. That's what everyone else is. Um, so I don't think it went noticed because that was the environment that I was in. And so everyone was doing it. So why why would it be any different for me? So did you have a feeling that you were kind of keeping up an illusion of yourself, which you did not really fit into anymore that well? Definitely. There was, there was just the illusion of, you know, I am at this location, at this place and I'm a leader and I am, I'm guiding these students and so, and postdocs and 
this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, but inside felt like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> why, you know, what, why am I, why am I doing this? Um, why am I, you know, spending so much time and effort um, if I don't feel good about it, right? Because it just didn't feel um, positive. So Maria and Dina, do you think this is typical? Or would you say that people with burnout, they just kind of keep going at, at a probably rather high level uh, at a fast pace and then it suddenly drops and they stop? Or do you think this is a more, more gradual thing that's happening over time? Well, there are individual differences in the way that people um, uh, deal with burnout or the way that they cope, but generally, looks like this is a bit more, let's say, a long-term issue. So it, they might, it might start uh, quite gradually. Um, people have some signs of burnout if there is no support and if, if they keep uh, more in their schedule, if they, if they, and this brings perhaps more and more difficult or also in terms of relationships with colleagues and um, if there are health professionals with patients as well. And this kind of creates a vicious cycle, but then, then the end, of, um, the end, uh, uh, the end of it is um, either uh, some professionals decide to actually um, drop out from uh, from work or to turn over, uh, or and the, my, some of them might also have significant um, health, significant physical and mental health um, um, adverse outcomes as well, such as um, depression, which is often linked with burnout or even actual physical problems like uh, uh, like uh, cardiovascular problems, for example. And also there has been research uh, linking at several uh, areas in the brain with burnout. For example, uh, studies on people with burnout have shown that the amygdala in the brain is enlarged. And this makes mainly the people to, to be moodier, as Kelly uh, explain that she changed her character and this their amygdala is also related to other areas in the brain that are connected with emotional distress. So there is also a, an anatomical background as well that may explain the symptoms uh, people feel. That makes sense. It totally did feel like that lizard brain, that amygdala just firing all of the time and was in control, right? It was just trying to survive and get to some place that felt safe versus um versus the frontal cortex that can see that there was you know that there was impact and that this was a great thing that i was doing um, versus just being so reactionary um, so um and 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 after you realize basically um that you had the problem and you kind of were able to give a name to to the problem that you were facing um, so what were your first steps actually? So what were the first things that you do, uh, that you did? Um, did you speak to uh, your coworkers or did you just say I'm on vacation now, I'm not coming back anytime soon? Or what were your reactions to it? Yeah, so um, so after this, the, I had three psychologists it took to, to convince me that I need to take the time off. So once I was convinced, um, I was really open with everyone because I was at a point where physically I just couldn't do it anymore. There was no option. I mean, I was going to end up, as one said, I was going to end up with a heart attack or I was going to, to do this now. So I was going to take the time off. Um, I went to my um, supervisor and, and he was great in that we reorganized my work, distributed it so that I did not have to do that um, during the, the time that I was going to be away. And I was really open with it because I there was no other way to tell people that I'm gone for two months um, and I will not be um, reachable. I will not be you know consultable for two months. Um, and the reaction was actually amazing. So many people came to me and said, "I'm experiencing those exact symptoms. Like, can I talk? Can I talk to you after you know after you're done?" Um, because there were many people on the team who were experiencing the same things and kind of having the physical, um, like physical um, effects of burnout as well. Um, so I found it really liberating and supporting once I was able to actually articulate it to people that this was a thing that had to be done um, for my health and it felt empowering for myself and I think it empowered others to take care of themselves as well. It's very important in this situation to to have the peer support. It's one of the 
and also the, and also the support of the family and friends it's actually one of the positive things that can help uh, prevent burnout and if the burnout happens then it's the best way in order to not to happen again as well in addition to many other uh, details that we can discuss because this is mainly an organizational issue and not only a personal issue so it's how the organizations the institutions uh, actually deal with this well-known problem in, in in high achievers do, do you think dina this is uh, specifically also a problem for for researchers scientists and healthcare professionals or would you say it's equally distributed across the workforce in academia uh, i think it's equally distributed in uh, in academia well in academia people also are doing research it's one in their own field mm -hmm. uh, but i think in any working environment when there is no um, protected time when there is a, a lot of uh, heavy workload when there is no um, time for exercise or having a um, time for for personal uh, things then i think this is a well known well known risk that uh, people can get to to burn out in this way yeah and i think it's the connections also as an academic there's a lot of focus um, as you become a professor um, that you are a, a lone wolf that you're the one who's leading this and that you're somehow alone um, and that you should be doing it all yourself. Um, and when there's more connection in a team, I felt much more, or I felt less less burnout when there was people that I could talk to honestly about what was going on versus the very formal, oh, of course I'm okay. When someone asks you, you know, how was your day? And everyone says, everyone says fine and gets on with the meeting. Um, having more actual interaction, vulnerable interaction um, is important. And would you suggest, or would, would there have been any measures that could have been taken by the institutions that that you are working for? Um, and I think this is directed at everybody on, in the panel here. Would there be any actions that you would expect from institutions to install to to prevent burnout um, or to help people recognize burnout early? I personally think um, having very clearly defined roles um, and responsibilities helps. Um, and taking a look at how much is expected. Um, if you were to probably do a, what would be called a desk audit or looking at the hours that you need for saying serving on committees and mentoring students and writing papers, as well as the bureaucratic work, you would probably come up with two, two full-time jobs or three full-time jobs. Um, so trying to figure out what is actually reasonable um, in the amount of time that you have. And it's also what brings folks joy. Um, now, I actually also love a spreadsheet. Every once in a while, a spreadsheet or like doing PowerPoint slides is my favorite thing. Um, but that's only a part of the time, right? I also have to have that interaction with teaching and I have to um, communicating science as well as some research. So how to help uh, help me grow in my research and um, and part of it's also my own self is uh, learning boundaries as to how much I can actually do in a day, um, and how to how to do that better. Yes, and also institutions may um, first of all I think provide the resources to people to know what uh, it may happen, and in addition to that, it's also a leadership thing. So the leadership should recognize that there is this risk. So make sure that people have protected time, uh, that there are uh, places in the department or in the lab where people can get connected like uh, coffee breaks and uh, also provide, I think, which is quite important, mentoring. So uh, providing mentoring and uh, support uh, at uh, all levels of uh, seniority, if from starting from a PhD student up to the professor level because burnout can happen to to anyone at any level it may be more common in younger ages but also uh, people in senior positions uh, may feel the same so it, yeah. it needs to and be, I'd be interested in, yeah and i'd be i'd be interested in how different it looks in folks who are younger in their career versus uh, later in their career um, because, you know, in some ways, um, as I, I was already 20 years into my career or 15 years into my career, 
Um, I think people let me pass sometimes, and that's why it didn't get noticed. My work passed, whereas a younger um, researcher might not have the ability to kind of ride on the work that they've done before or be able to pass that they they have work or they have a reputation um, so that they can say no, so that they can um, be a little choosier um, in the end. So I wonder how different it looks early in your career versus later in your career. I could imagine that's also, a, no, yeah, I, I believe there's also a certain transition um, in the kind of support that you need and of course uh, in the kind of support that you can give to your to your own mentees um, along the career and um do you have any advice like as as a mentor because i know you are all mentoring students um how to build this kind of culture of appreciation um and i mean think, i think it's always um hard to find the right way because of course uh, when we are uh, in research when we're working as doctors we, we we are kind of passionate for our jobs we we are really burning for our jobs in a sense um but there's also maybe this this wrong appreciation of always working over hours and always going not only the one extra mile but the three extra miles so is this something that you talk about when you're talking with your mentees yes now it is something that i talk about and implement with any team that i work on so um at these group meetings i have a time for celebration and ask folks to talk about other people or their own celebrations. And I try to model that. Um, I also try to model um, in terms of time off. I don't want you on your cell phone. I do not want an email from you. I do not want a you know text. Um, it is your time off. Um, and that is one of the things that I became much stricter with um, after this burnout journey is that the phone goes off at a, my work phone goes off at you know 5 30 um, mm -hmm. you know right away. And I then um, will go ahead and do something else for myself. So whether it's cook dinner, go for a walk outside, light it, even just light a candle just to symbolize like, okay, this is done. Work is done, blow it out. Now on to the rest of life. So just being very clear with boundaries. So it's something that I have incorporated just to make sure that I don't go back there. So Dina, do you think this is something that we can implement somehow in, in healthcare? I think, yes, it, it's a question of the leadership and decisions at the organizational level that uh, we need to uh, actually make uh, environments that uh, recognize achievement, uh, that uh, reward achievement, uh, that provide a work-life balance to make sure that people have uh, time for, for themselves in, uh, enough. And also, uh, as mentioned before, provide the resources so people uh, are aware uh, what is it could happen if they continue uh, in a way that they overwork uh, themselves. So uh, it, it has to be done uh, to, to be realized and make sure that uh, there is space for people to grow, but will not overgrow with a lot of responsibilities and Maria has done a lot of research on that that showed uh, that actually when you have people with burnout or at risk with burnout in the organization then they do the the overall work does not proceed well so they do not actually uh, perform well so that's it will be good for the outcome and there's a lot of uh, data for that and I wanted to add in Dina's um, excellent point that um, there is research which is showing that most of the research actually and most of the policies are focusing on individual um, um, approaches to improving well-being and uh, preventing burnout in healthcare organizations. And that sometimes uh, poses the responsibility almost to individuals and um, and makes it more like a personal issue. But most of the evidence so far shows that the that burnout is more organizational, let's say, issue. It's a, it's a problem of the whole um, uh, the whole uh, culture. And um, studies have shown that what really health professionals are value most is changes in the way that they work. So in terms of um, the workflow, in terms of the workload. Um, in terms of how teams are based and how they communicate with each other. 
And that's really important to implement if we want to see some changes, because some of the, you know, like mindfulness techniques and um, whatever is targeted at individual basis is useful, but on the other side, it's not a solution because the main roots of the problem is uh, at the way that um, healthcare um, services are organized and function. And would you say that that burnout is always job related? I mean, I'm not sure what the exact definition would be there, but could you also say burnout is um, uh, can also occur um, outside of the job? Well, I mean, it is mainly job related. It might have consequences, much broader consequences in terms of personal life, in terms of um, um, social life. But more or less, it is centered around uh, the job. That's and this this is one difference between, let's say, um, burnout and other mental health conditions such as depression. Although they have some similar uh, signs, such as exhaustion, lack of concentration, when when an individual is actually they move from a dysfunctional, let's say, work environment, they're quite um, they frequently recover quite soon because then the main um, they recover quite soon from burnout. And while if someone suffers from depression, for example, it's um, it's something, it's really different. And then the approach must be different in terms, in terms of medication, in terms of uh, psychotherapy. So that's really important how we actually distinguish burnout and, um, and depression because the solutions are also different. I see. So this, this kinetics of recovery basically is, is a yes. good way to distinguish um, those diseases. And um, so we, we noticed um, when we talked earlier, we are an all female panel. Um, and so do you think that that female um, females are more prone to burnout than males or is there no gender difference? This is um, what most of the research is showing that women, uh, women are more uh, prone to burnout. And there are several reasons why this, um, uh, this is true. One reason is that uh, women are often having have multiple responsibilities, so it's um, in multiple roles. Uh, at the same time, they may not be receiving the same rewards in their job. They might not be able to see the same career progression as well. And there, we have also seen that um, they, they're more likely to be harassed or bullied, bullied during their work. So. Um, it's really important to have um, gender-based, let's say, preventative approaches for burnout in um, in uh, healthcare organization. Is that Dina and Kelly? Is that also what what you are seeing? I mean, Kelly, you you mentioned that after you kind of outed yourself um, to be suffering from burnout um, back then, um, that several people approached you and colleagues approached you and sharing with you their story, and that they were also having some some issues there. So um, do you feel these are both male and female? So was it just a strictly female uh, person? I actually, I work in such a male dominated field. Uh, it was mainly male. Um, and uh, there were there were both, but um, it was mainly males that um, approached me. And again, in some ways didn't have the words to put to it. Whereas some of the women were like, oh yeah, I knew I was burned out. Um, whereas the men were like, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> and so I think there is there is the burnout in in men as well. It might just kind of look different, and they don't necessarily have the words um, to talk about to talk about it or their feelings as much as women societally, you know, in the are trained to talk about our feelings. I just generally wanted to add that everyone is prone to burnout. They, I mean, everyone who's working hard, who is actually uh, who's taking lots of responsibilities who work in, um, in sometimes in, a, in other hard conditions, let's say. Uh, so, but there is some evidence, some specific groups like um, women, also doctors in training, um, as well as uh, sometimes um, um, doctors who have uh, come from different, let's say, um, cultural backgrounds as well. So there are some uh, key groups that might, uh, that are, um, more likely to experience uh, signs of burnout. But what we have seen from the recent surveys is that uh, burnout is um, kind of shockingly common uh, in, um, in, uh, in health professionals. So 
no one is really uh, no one is really um out of it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Actually, I'm realizing we've already passed the 30 minutes. Um, so we have come to an have to come to an end. Um, is there any last sentence from all of you that you would like to share? Well, I would like to um, highlight that the need for uh, having personal time, among other things. So, okay, we discussed about institutional uh, responsibilities, but as ourselves as well may need to make time for ourselves go out in the nature exercise and also uh, eating well is a big thing in this uh, kind of uh, uh, risk and makes things better so provides more energy that is needed and peer and support <laughs> also important mm -hmm. I would like to add that it is really important to dis destigmatize the issue that we can openly talk about it and seek support and um, uh, and provide reassurance because trying to uh, to kind of hide it or not measuring it or not discussing about about it it's only going to make things worse. So it's really important that um, it's a topic that is discussed within within each practice, within each team and within each organization. Definitely. And I would like to add that again, it is uh, something that you can take care of yourself uh, in terms of you need to take care of yourself with burnout, um, making sure to um, f seek help, find the help that you need, um, whether that be professional, whether that um, be turning to family for support, um, and taking that time because life is a very dynamic dance, not this, oh, I worked eight hours and so now I need eight hours with my family, but it's a dynamic dance of what brings you joy and how do you um, really find that spark again and that little bits of joy in your day um, to make really life worth living. And it's something that can be worked through and actually bring you to a better place to better understand what is important to you. Why are you doing this? Um, maybe it's just changing something slightly. Maybe it is changing jobs, um, but figuring out maybe it's changing, you know, um, other things in your life, but making those conscious choices um, so that you really can heal from this and do um, the amazing things you're meant to do. Well, thank you all three of you so much for joining on in on this ESA studio. And I think we have raised important points. Um, we have emphasize that we need to recognize uh, symptoms of burnout and we need to do something about it that there's also a need for the institutions for which we are working for uh, to realize that this is a problem um, that uh, we need to improve here and uh, we need to prevent us and society from losing some of their brightest minds and with this i think we will need to finish but actually next week there will be the 100th episode of the ESA studio so time to celebrate i'd say and um, next week we will find out what does it really take to implement lifestyle modifications thank you so much for listening thank you so much for watching and remember to become a member and join the easy family goodbye bye, bye. bye.